Today I'd like to talk to you about Solomon Cherishevsky, who's a film musician and newspaper reporter in Moscow in the 1920s. Every morning the editor of the newspaper would hold his briefings, giving out the stories of the day, information he'd like the reporters to find out, and so on. And Cherishevsky, or S as he was known, would just sit there, impassively listening, not taking any notes, just sitting there. All the other reporters had their notebooks out, frantically scribbling down all the information. And the editor was about to admonish S for a lack of attention and not getting engaged in the meeting. But S was able to recite back everything that had been said perfectly. And he didn't think it was unusual. He thought that everybody memorised like that. He couldn't see how if somebody told him something, he couldn't, other people couldn't remember what had been said. He just thought it was actually absolutely natural. But then the editor assured him this was not normal and said, go and see the psychology department at the University of Moscow to find out how you do this. So he booked an appointment with uh, Dr. Alexander Luria and showed him the letter from the editor asking his memory to be tested. And Luria, not expecting anything special, just gave him a standard memory test, some uh, numbers and words written down, others verbally. But S was able to recite them all back 100% perfectly. So Luria tried a longer test, same thing happened. And this piqued his interest. And it ended up being a 30 year research project where S would visit, visit Luria on a regular basis, sometimes separated by weeks and months, other times separated by years. And what was really remarkable is that even several years later, without any prior warning, S could still recite the data he was, was being presented with several years earlier. And not only that, he'd remember the context. So he would say, we met in your apartment, you were sitting at your desk, I was sitting in the rocking chair, and you said to me these words, and he was able to recite those perfectly. So a fantastic amount of data to be memorised, and also duration, longevity of that data as well. And in the end, Lurie decided there was no point trying to find the limit of S's memory, because he didn't appear to have one. It was infinite capacity. So he then set about trying to find out how S did this, and also how he thought, his personality, and the effects of having a perfect memory on his uh, psychological outlook on life and so on. So it's a fascinating book that um, Nuria wrote called The Mind of a Nemonist. Highly recommended uh, you read this if you're interested in the story. So S had a special medical condition called synesthesia. It's a blending of the senses, five-way synesthesia. So every sense triggered every other sense. So he could smell colours, he could taste words, had a physical sensation in his fingers when he read things and so on. So he had these extra associations he could make based on the fact that every sense gave him multiple um, assets that he could then connect to help him memorise things. He also used naturally locations around Moscow. So you imagine the things he was asked to um, recall being happening in certain locations. But it's interesting the way he approached problem solving, always visually. He had no um, abstraction of his thinking. So one problem he was given was imagine a two-volume dictionary on a shelf that would be volume, volume one next to volume two, left to right, and each dictionary has 400 words, or each volume has 400 words in the book. And a bookworm starts eating on page one of volume one and continues eating through the pages till it reaches page 400 of volume 2. So logically, mathematically, you think, well, 400 plus 400 must be 800 pages. But S didn't see it like that and got the right answer instantly without seeing that could, there could possibly be any other solution to the problem. So if you imagine the books sitting on the, on the shelf, you can see that the front cover of the first volume is actually next to the back cover of the second volume. So if the bookworm starts on page one of the first volume, moves to the right, eating, 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 the first thing you'll find is the cover of the first volume, the next thing you find is the back cover of the second volume, and then he'll reach page 400 of the second volume. So it only actually eats through the bindings, doesn't eat through any through the internal pages. So you say two pages if you can count the bindings of pages, 
or zero pages if you just count the internal printed pages of the book. And S couldn't see any other solution to that. It was the fact that he always approached things visually meant that that was not a, he was not, uh, didn't fall into the trap of thinking that was 800. And so he had the ability to visualize in his imagination, had the ability to make connections and associations to his synesthesia. And he naturally used locations around Moscow to memorize the things he was asked to memorize. So he's in effect using exactly the same techniques as mental athletes use nowadays in their systems of imagination, association, location, but he did it naturally. He actually quit the newspaper, ended up getting a job as a professional memorist, so on stage memorizing things as a, as a showman, but towards the end of his life, he became um, tragically tortured that his inability for, to forget became a source of anxiety for him. He tried to write things down and burn them in an effort to forget. So actually, so they had a, a tragic end to a remarkable individual who's taught the psychologists and the memory athletes so much about how to memorize things effectively. So hopefully that's been of interest. Talk to you again next week about another hero of memorizers of yesteryear. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.